Welcome to Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Delling Pool. Welcome to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool. And to say I'm excited about my guest this week would be um, an understatement. I would say that this guest is at least as exciting. We're, we're talking Roger Scruton territory, actually. It's that exciting. I have landed myself only one of the, and he'll probably be, probably be embarrassed by this, only one of the world's greatest composers. Um, and also, he's really interesting politically, too. His name is James McMillan, Sir James McMillan, indeed. And um, I first discovered him, apart from, I, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a classical buff, but, I, but I've heard and enjoyed some of his music. Um, but also his writings. He writes like a dream. Uh, his articles in Standpoint, which is a conservative magazine in, in Britain. And I thought I'd ask James, welcome to the show, James. It's great to be here. Um, to put himself slightly in context by by reading out a bit of one of the articles that really made me think, I so want to interview this guy. So far away, James. The traditional family, education, sexual morality, artistic aspirations, religious belief, these are all now sold to us as mere strategies of the powerful and the coercive reactionary designed to enforce conformity and slavish obedience to outmoded fashions. The most eager proponents of this revolutionary rag- radicalism from the, from the Romantics onwards were artists, of course. For the Romantic of the 19th, 20th and now 21st centuries, the attraction of revolution, and any old revolution would do, has been a constant leitmotif. Revolution, which preferably overturned manners and lifestyles as well as aesthetics and politics, has been the slogan and banner for generations of certain types of creative idealists. But what have these fashionable revolutions to do with a love of life, or even of a love of the poor, or the outsider? They seem more concerned with a love of transgression, a fetish for flouting the traditions, values and morality of established communities and peoples, which the hero, rebel, artist wants to be seen rejecting. Their war against their own roots has been bloody and relentless. They seem punch drunk with their onslaught and clobbering. It is clearly addictive and in the past has led artists as much to the extreme right as to the far left. It is not the upholders of tradition that have strategy, as claimed. If anyone has a strategy, it is our new cultural elite, and their aim is to attack the institutions and principles of our shared common life. What began as a light-headed teenage rebellion has become a cultural regime, which judges artists and their work on the basis of how they contribute to the remodelling, or indeed the overthrow, of society's core institutions and ethics. You see, you really are. You are a radical. You're the true radical, and you're calling out the artistic brotherhood and sisterhood as fake radicals, that they're into destruction and mindless, mindless sort of teenage shows of rebellion, when you're upholding Western civilization, I'd say. Well, it's very kind of you to say so. Um, I think there is a, a, a strain of uh, romantic virtue signalling amongst the, the, the artistic class. Uh, they know it's in their interests to uh, play to their own gallery, to play to their own tribe. And when they claim that they're being edgy and uh, defiant and brave, they're actually not. Um, wh- when they, they preach to the converted or preach to the like-minded, um, they, they're, they're not reaching out to anyone beyond their own little tribe, little subsect in society. And therefore their, their, their fall radicalism is weak. And to me, the real countercultural voices, the real countercultural figures in the arts, as well as many other aspects of our society, uh, are those who, uh, for example, um, 
uh, see the search for the sacred in our life as important, or those who will uh, hold to established values, uh, the, start, the values that have been given to us down the ages, through the generations, especially from the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, these are the real countercultural values of our time. And perhaps what you say is right, it's not just me, I suppose, I'm flattered that you consider me uh, to be the radical, but I, I, I seek out uh, those uh, truly brave countercultural voices uh, for succour and for friendship. Well, I was doing a bit of my homework before I, because I, I didn't want to come in completely deaf <laughs> to, to interview a, a composer. And I was struck as I listened to some of your absolutely beautiful compositions. It took me back, for example, to the kind of music that might have been listened to in cathedrals in, say, the time of Henry V. Um, and that got me thinking about what it is that makes our civil makes Western civilization great, and a lot of that has to do with the church, doesn't it? Which is the thing that we've perhaps rejected above all in our modern culture. That's right. I mean, uh, one of the abiding uh, things about about modern music, even even you know, mod music in modernity, music in our time, is that composers have never really given up. Uh, that sense of the other, that sense of the divine, and even the even although they may not pursue it in um, in the kind of conventional uh, ways that I might do, you can trace in, in modernity uh, a search for the sacred amongst the major composers of our time. Um, uh, and it's not just a, it's not a genuflection to the past. We're talking about really radical figures of the 20th century, like Stravinsky who wrote the Rite of Spring, who wrote these revolutionary works, but he was a believer. He wrote them, he set the Mass, he set the Psalms, he set little prayers like the Pater Noster. Uh, and then the other great figure, uh, that other great polar figure of early modernism, Schoenberg, the much maligned Ar Ar Arnold Schoenberg, uh, was a mystic and reconverted to a practicing Judaism later in his life when he left Germany. And you can feel the, the, uh, the world of Jewish uh, culture and theology in his later works. It's no surprise to me that uh, another radical figure of our times, John Cage, went to study with uh, Schoenberg. John Cage, of course, uh, that, that notorious figure, wrote this uh, incredible piece of music called 433, that is 4 minutes 33 seconds of silence, a kind of provocation to our culture, a challenge to our listening sensibilities or lack of them. The, the curious thing or the fascinating thing about that work was his original title for it was fourth, sorry, his original title for it was Silent Prayer. So he's uh, already edging into that territory. He pursued his own search for the sacred and the, the, the ideas and, and indeed the religions of the Far East. And then Olivier Messiaen was famously Catholic and every note that he, he wrote, one of the great radical figures of the 20th century who inspired Boulez and Stockhausen. And uh, all the composers who came after Shostakovich uh, from behind what was the Iron Curtain were deeply devout. Schnitke, um, Gubay Dolina, uh, Arvo Pert, of course, uh, Gia Cancelli, uh, Goretzky, uh, all profoundly religious people reacting radically against the state-imposed atheism of the Soviet Union uh, in, in their work. And even in this country, in the United Kingdom, after Benjamin Britten, who, who set the war wreck and wrote music for the church, have, have come people like John T Taverner and uh, uh, Jonathan Harvey, uh, so, apart instead of music being, uh, or, or religion and music that uh, being a, a, re a reactionary thing, a, a conservative thing, a peripheral thing, you could make the case, you could make the argument that m musical modernity has had this search for religion and the spirit right at its core, and is that a, is that a? Tr uh, a, a conservative triumphalist thing to say, some might say, but I think, uh, to get back to your original point, it, it, it's it's part of the true radicalism of our time, not the faux radicalism of the lovies. I was wondering, actually, going on from that, do you think that, in a way, sacred music has kept the church honest? Because I, I once went to a, a mass at Westminster Cathedral um, held by Cardinal Hume 
And I was thinking, this is going to be great. There's going to be some fantastic music here. It's going to be great choral music and stuff. Instead, we had guitar strumming nuns. I mean, literally, we had guitar strumming nuns. And I was thinking, this is what I thought people fled the, the Church of England to, to embrace proper religion. And instead, Catholicism, the, uh, the, the Church of Smells and Bells, has been, has, 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 has been taken too. It's a very good point. Uh, how long have you got? Um, <laughs> I have the scars to prove that, this, that liturgy is a war zone, in fact. Um, you know, in the church, in the churches, we hear a lot about truth. We hear a lot about goodness, quite rightly. But what about the other one? Truth, goodness and beauty make up a triad of terms uh, that have been the values of Western civilization uh, right from the beginning and, and, and right at the heart of, of the Judeo-Christian experience. So beauty is part of the Christian tradition and heritage. And to turn our backs on beauty, to dumb down the arts, whether you're an Anglican or a Catholic uh, or whatever, is, is a kind of crime against beauty and maybe even a crime against, against God. And you know, the Catholic Church has been through its 1960s experience too. Those who were young in the 60s have caused a lot of damage uh, inside and outside of the church. And they were the ones in the Catholic Church who thought that dumbing down, uh, making it more democratic, less hierarchical, uh, 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 and uh, and less to do with the heritage and the tradition of the church would be the way forward. And that has meant throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's meant getting rid of a, a huge tranche of beautiful music, uh, maintained mostly by the Anglicans, it has to be said, and there are wonderful cathedrals and collegiate chapels. But it's only really in certain places, and I'm glad to say Westminster Cathedral is back on track, but it took a few other cardinals to do that, um, that um, the traditions w will be maintained and and uh, savoured in certain important places. Not every little parish in the land can have uh, Palestrina every mass, but they can have a little snatch of plain song, which takes us right back to the roots of the church and indeed to beyond beyond before the church, because plain song came out of the, the the synagogue. Yeah, I was wondering whether perhaps all this beauty has survived almost despite the church hierarchy rather than because of it. I mean, I, I know that you, you've written how there was, when you were trying to write choral music, there was resistance from within the Scottish Catholic Church, from people who felt that it was elitist and they wanted something more, you know, down with the ordinary people. That's right, and that's a specific uh, event. It was in connected with it was connected with uh, the visit of Pope Benedict to the United Kingdom in two thousand and ten, when you know the the bishops in Scotland and England asked me to write a new congregational mass, amongst other things. For uh, and a congregational mass is an odd thing, and I've stopped doing them because it's <laughs> there's only so many you can write. But at the time, you know, this was a great challenge. How does one write a piece of music? a substantial piece of music that ordinary people would sing, not so much in the pews, but in the fields, that, uh, because they were for open air liturgies at Bella Houston Park and Cofton Park uh, in England. Um, how would you write uh, a, a music that shows the tradition, that is in keeping with the liturgy, but involves as many people as possible? Now, there were elements uh, within the church, uh, mostly north of the border, who's, who maintained that an art composer, such as myself, didn't have the pastoral experience and down-with-the-people experience uh, to do that properly, and it needed one of them to do it. Um, Somebody a bit crap, basically. <laughs> uh, your words, not mine. <laughs> uh, and, and it was resisted, and there was an attempt to... Uh, scupper the whole idea. Thankfully the bishops, both north and south, uh, held, to, held to their original plan. But it, it, it uh, you know, it's it's not nice to have that, uh, to fight fight those kind of wars against fellow Christians. And it's all to do with a culture war at the, part, at the, at the heart of the Catholic Church. And uh, um, they maintain that people like, like myself are not just elitist, but tridentinists, which is a real, uh, a really false accusation. I, I'm as much a Vatican II Catholic as anyone else. I like Latin, I like the old the old ways, but I'm not trying to overturn what the church has done. Um, uh, I, and I, I want music that sounds Catholic, 
Uh, and that that's plain song actually. If we can, and we can do it in English, as the Anglicans do in ma- many many wonderful situations. So uh, I I've been fighting for a, a democratization of music, but not in the way that the old trendies and the old hippies want. I love the way that you're you're referred to as an art art composer. Do you, I mean, is that a what is an art composer? Well, they're meaning someone from the classical background, someone yeah. that has had experience of, of of modern music, perhaps, and and therefore the implication is someone that is that is out of touch with the ordinary folk. But that isn't the case. If you look at the British composers, and again we're getting into non-religious territory here, but the British composer, maybe perhaps uh, in contradistinction to his. Uh, his or her um, uh, European contemporaries uh, and counterparts have always valued their place in the community. Uh, Benjamin Britten, uh, Peter Maxwell Davis, Vaughan Williams, Holst, um, Michael Tippett uh, valued the chance to write for amateurs, to write for children, to write for ordinary people, non-specialists. Some of Be- Benjamin Britten's greatest works were written for children. Noise Flood, an, an opera for children to perform as well as to enjoy and see. They, they well, the Young the Person's Guide to the Orchestra was that was exactly yeah that and was the first thing I, I did in our classical music class at school. That's right, yeah. and so it right, it's right in with the bricks of the British musical experience that one serves his community, one is useful to his community, and that's not dumbing down. It's not being an artisan rather than a, a, an artist, but the, 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 there persists this view that uh, classical music is for the elites. And the experience of the British composer uh, shows that that is just false. You, you, you just reminded me, you wrote once about how um, lots of composers are massive football fans, including Edward Elgar, who was, who was a big Wolves fan, and he set a piece of music that's right. Uh, Edward Elgar would uh, cycle uh, from Worcester to Molyneux Park uh, regularly to see the games at Wolverhampton Wanderers. That's quite a way. It is. In those days, that's what they did. Because <laughs> the Wolves are my team, you see. So, I, and I was born ah. in Worcester, so I uh-huh. suppose there's, a, there's an Elgar connection suddenly. Absolutely. And what was the what was the phrase that he set to music? Uh, it, it was I can't remember now, but it was it was something to do with one of the players uh, n- knocking the ball into the back of the net. Yeah, something in the, involving the leather, something the, that's right, banging the banging leather. in the leather. Yeah, <laughs> and he, he wrote this for the fans. I mean, how how democratic can you get? And and yeah. this is non-specialists singing the music of a great composer. I was wondering actually, um, one of the few areas. My my my, my daughter is a musician. Um, does music at school and it seems to me that one of the few areas which hasn't dumbed down in our culture and hasn't reduced its standards um, are musical grades I don't I don't think if you get a grade 8 today it's any less rigorous than it was 30 years ago is that right that's absolutely right the associated boards and similar bodies have kept standards very high uh, much sometimes to the annoyance of the educational establishment who are always trying to uh, dumb down things and um, uh, but the associated boards keep their standards high and if, if school children in whatever part of society want to pass their associated boards exam they've got to raise their game to the traditionally high standards do you think that's because you ultimately you can't fake um skill in music you right there are certain levels of attainment and if you don't attain them it's bloody obvious to other musicians that's right and and not everyone is made to be a musician not everyone's made to be a composer um and i can understand the the desire for democratization in schools especially music you know get more people involved in music and whatever way you do that that's great however if that is at the expense of quality and if it discourages the ge- discourages the genuinely talented from pursuing their vocations as artists then uh, that could be a disaster and the, there's there's signs uh, that the dumbing down has had an effect We've got to maintain the standards for those who want to pursue uh, a truly high f- uh, level of musical life, uh, as well as keeping everyone else involved as well, yeah. further down the, the chain. Well, otherwise, what's the, I mean, if we can't maintain standards, we may as well give up, hadn't we? 
That's right, and and this is a, a constant battle in education, and uh, uh, it's certainly, as you're aware, down here in England, uh, the, the, when we refer to the blob as the the educational establishment, who seems to have um, um, have something have some major problems with the idea of standards in education. Up north, we have the Mac blob, which is even worse, uh, and involves every level of education. And uh, no, there, there could never be a free school in Scotland, for example, and uh, could, uh, and 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 even even the, uh, the private education, uh, independent education of whatever forms are under constant attack in Scotland, more, more so than down here. So um, there are, there are, uh, there's going to be a constant battle and, and those of us who are not elitist, those of us who are from the working class and have had working at class experiences, nevertheless will have to fight against these blobs. I'm going to ask you about Scotland and your working class background in the next section. You're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my uber, uber special guest, Sir James McMillan. More in a moment. Hey, folks, I want to tell you about Breitbart News Second Amendment newsletter, Downrange with A.W.R. Hawkins. Features the top gun stories of the week, every week, and guest columnists like Gun Owners of America's Larry Pratt or Armed American Radio's Mark Walters. Also features a review of a firearm or a firearm accessory each week. The newsletter downloads on Thursday comes right to your email inbox. You can subscribe at Breitbart.com backslash AWR. This is Delling Pole, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pole. Welcome back to the Delling Pole podcast with me, James Delling Pole. And this is this is actually probably the most cultured podcast I've ever done and probably ever will do with Sir James McMillan, one of the world's best composers. Um, and even though Sir James, or James as I'm going to call him, um, is in a rarefied field, notionally, you actually you actually quite you come from a very ordinary background, don't you? Absolutely. My grandfather was a coal miner um, all his life, so he worked down down the mines in the dark uh, through the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s and so on. Um, he was the, the, the one in, that loved music. He, he was a, a euphonium player. Uh, as a youngster, played in colliery bands and he got me my first cornet and took me to my first band practices and got me organ books and so on. He sang in his local choir. Uh, my dad, who's still alive, is a, a retired carpenter. Uh, I went to a state school in in the west of Scotland. Um, uh, my mum was uh, a, a social worker for a little while. Um, so I mean, uh, I, I'm a man of the soil, if you, if you like. I grew up in a, 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 a semi-rural part of the west of Scotland, but coal mining was the the main industry. So, how on earth did you did you discover that you had a musical talent? Uh, in a very mundane way, a teacher brought some plastic recorders into school when we were about eight or nine, and that was it. A light went on. I started playing. I started wanting to make my little tunes. I began to start hearing about composers. My mother had played piano at school. Uh, my grandfather thought that my mother was going to be the musician and kind of pushed her too hard, uh, and it didn't work out. Uh, so when I came along, he was delighted. So yeah, th- that used to happen when I was at school as well. That th- in, in you know when I was at primary school, we used to be given record. Does that still happen? I think so. Yeah, that's good. And did you did you notice was that did you see that you were progressing much more quickly than anyone else, or, or was it just that I like this, I want to do this? Both. Uh, I've be, uh, developed a facility for the instrument, and then wanted to play other instruments. For me, it was brass because of the. The, the, where I was from, brass bands are important right. in, in industrial areas, post-industrial areas, whether it be Ayrshire or West Lothian, Leicestershire, for example. Um, uh, so it was the local band culture that, that drew me in. I started playing piano as well, and I got pressed into service to, uh, at school for, for that, and I eventually played the organ at Mass and that sort of thing. And actually, I'm, I'm going to come on to your, your, your becoming successful in a moment. Um, the, what... Why is it that coal mines produced such beautiful bands and beautiful choirs? I think it's because they uh, dealt with the grime, literally the grime and dirt of life, uh, in, in such a way that they sought out beauty. Uh, in a v- in a fervent way, it meant uh, the world to them to find beauty in their lives, uh, a, 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 a life lives that were devoid of beauty, 
and were really, really hard. Uh, so that you know, my grandfather would want to sing, make beautiful sounds with his choir at church, or make beautiful sounds when uh, when the shift uh, down the pit came to an end. And um, it, it was that search for a beauty that they knew was there, but did, they didn't have access to it in their daily working lives. Uh, and so they developed a love for a practical music, a functional music, whether it be for the church or for the uh, the community. Uh, but they became aware of this wider world of music, which involved the classical classical music and jazz and so on. So a lot of those men of that generation uh, developed a, a, an open-minded view of music and, a, a, and an open search for as much music as they could encounter. Opera as well. So, blimey. So, you went to um, music college? I went to uh, uh, a ju- junior college, as it were, uh, as, a, as a junior at the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama, but eventually I chose to pursue a, a, a university career. I, I, I studied music at Edinburgh University and then did postgraduate work at, at Durham. It's a slightly different way of doing music from colleges, but you know, as, as you know yourself, you probably came across many uh, musicians from the music department of Oxbridge and so on. It's it's a good way of learning about music. It's a little bit more academic, but it can it can suit someone like me who's a composer. But I imagine imagine the number of people who make it as composers must be passing few. It depends. There, there are different ways of being a composer. Um, lots of my colleagues make lots of money out of writing music for television. Uh, and films, uh, which is great. I, it's something I couldn't do. Uh, good luck to them. Uh, it's a different discipline, different mindset. But I chose very early on that I, w- I wanted to pursue the concert world or, or the stage or, or music for liturgy. It's a diverse experience of music I have. Um, but it, that that's a narrower world, I suppose. I think that's what your point is. And yeah. it's, it's sometimes difficult to find a way through there. Uh, but, you know, I, I am part of a generation of British composers who uh, are, are, are attracting and have attracted attention from around the world because of the uniqueness of their, of what they, they have to say. People like Mark Antony Turnage, who's about my age, George Benjamin, uh, Thomas Addis is a little younger. Um, uh, you know, the British composer does have a, a a, a reach beyond these shores, and our music's played all over the world. Can I can I ask a, a rude question? Where does the money come from? I, I mean, how is it? Do you get paid for commissioned works, or does it come from record sales? Or where, where's the bulk of your income from? It comes from very different sources. I would say I, I it's important to me that uh, uh, the commissions are good, so that when someone wants me to write a piece of music, then my publisher will. Uh, organize a contract that that pays me a commission. So a lot of it comes from commission. Um, PRS and, and various uh, ways of uh, you know, performing, performing rights, music, uh, uh, royalties uh, is another source of uh, um, uh, money. Uh, I, I'm also a jobbing musician, so I, I conduct a lot. Uh, does that uh, pay? It does, yes. Yeah. And, and, and uh, it's a nice balance to get to have it uh, it gets me out of the house as well because writing music is a very solitary experience and uh, I I have always loved performing so to get to get on stage with my fellow musicians to lead them in performances of a whole range of music not just mine not just modern music but the 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 classics is a great joy uh, to have that to do it sometimes not all the time I like watching that is is she was she Chinese the the woman who conducted your your European requiem she looked really good. She was fabulous, uh, and uh, this was in the in the BBC Proms. That's l- l- right. This t- twenty seventeen, so this year at the time of recording. Yes, yeah. it was great watching her work, and uh, um, I didn't get to many of the rehearsals because I was out of the country. But what a fantastic job she did! Uh, she worked well with the orchestra. The the BBC National Orchestra of Wales obviously loved her, and uh, she did a great job with the choirs too. So, where did that piece of music come from? The European Requiem. Well, it's an interesting one. Uh, the title is odd. Uh, it, it kind of came up, came back to bite me a bit. Uh, I wrote it well before all the politics of Brexit. Um, 
But th- then when I saw all this be- beginning, I had submitted the piece, I'd re- finished it a year before the performance. When it was first performed, it was at, at the Oregon Back Festival in the United States. It was the day after the Brexit vote. I arrived to a welter of questions about Nigel Farage and uh, David Cameron, uh, and the piece had nothing to do with Brexit. <laughs> continually having to battle against uh, people. And, and even at the time of the proms, there were people trying to make out that it was a, some sort of Brexit piece. It wasn't. And, uh, I mean, I've, I haven't declared my, my, my views on that. It's just too dangerous, I think, to do so. I wouldn't want to stray into that territory. But it had nothing to do with Brexit. It was inspired by uh, Roger Scruton's book, The Uses of Pessimism, which was a kind of counterblast against the fallacious optimisms that have so disfigured and nearly destroyed our continent of Europe. Fascism, Marxism, Communism, Nazism. And uh, he makes a a bold... um, um, manifesto for what makes Europe Europe, which is its Judeo- Judeo-Christian roots and the, a culture of mercy that came to Europe from the Middle East through friends of Jesus, like uh, Peter and and pa- Paul and the apostles, and to a lesser extent, uh, Douglas Murray's book, uh, recent book, uh, has explored a similar lament that these uh, uh, values that make Europe Europe may be dying. So my simply my question in this was positive if Europe is dying, if what makes Europe Europe is dead, then let us sing a requiem for it. So my, my piece is a requiem for a, a Europe that may have died. So do you want to give me a few examples of the kind of values that made Europe great that we're in danger of losing? I, I think it's a sense of uh, the sacred... Uh, for example, I mean, th- I know there's pe- people at like Douglas Murray who's a, who's a great secularist, of course, and makes similar claims. But he's n- he he realizes the importance of that sense of of the numinous in our culture, uh, given to us through the church uh, and and Judaism, of course, uh, the two religions that have been the main um, uh, enemies of those who have tried to destroy Europe uh, in the past uh, and, and, ma- and made a, a a desert of Europe in the twentieth century in the most violent century, um, these fallacious optimisms that grew out of the violent revolution of, of, the, of the French uh, in the late 18th century. Um, uh, and, and so I see uh, that, that great uh, culture of the spirit and John Paul II talked about the, the true European culture being a culture of the spirit, um, as being the, the genuine culture of Europe and a culture that we are losing, a culture that is actually being systematically destroyed by enemies of that culture. John Paul II asked the European Union to put some reference uh, to, to its Judeo-Christian heritage in, in its founding documents and, and the, the treaties and so on and the, that were being drawn up during the 1980s and 90s, and they point blank refused. In fact, they mocked him for it. I think we know who the, the enemies of, 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 uh, 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 of what makes Europe Europe truly are. Yeah, I think this is going to make a lot more sense to my special friend listening in America than it is to my special friend listening in 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 Britain. In that, that Americans generally are much less ashamed about their Christian heritage than we are now. We've almost erased it to the point where, when I went back to my old school, and I know, I know that, that university professors say the same thing, they say they can now no longer rely on any child coming to the school knowing the basic Bible stories. So that's that's our, our literary tradition. Yes, Go on. absolutely. Uh, and it, um, university teachers are finding this uh, more and more difficult. Uh, uh, and it not it doesn't it, it, it's a part of the dumbing down that we're talking about that uh, collective amnesia, almost an enforced amnesia um, by our culture uh, on wh- what makes makes us who we are, which which is a, a a real challenge and how on earth are we going to cope with it? But there there has been a forgetting uh, of. Um, uh, of the important core of of our Christian values uh, in Europe and and elsewhere, and uh, and that will have implications. It's interesting that most of the s- the most soundly conservative people I know, in both Britain and the U.S., tend to be Catholics. Mm. What? Why is that? <laughs> um, <laughs> Actually. Yes, uh, conservative small C. Some some of these conservative Catholics are actually. 
quite liberal in some things when it comes to voting, for example, but they, they have this uh, uh, deep connection with the past. Um, it's an acknowledgement that tradition is not necessarily reactionary and that tradition, whether it be political tradition, philosophical, artistic or indeed religious tradition, is a life-giving force. And the analogy that I use, which seems to, be, seems to come out of my Catholic worldview, is the, anal the analogy is that of a river. Tradition is like a river which flows from the deep past to forward in a forward motion to the future and we st stand on the bank of that river at this given time in history and this is a life-giving thing it's, it's something which irrigates human experience at any given point of that river and to put a dam into that river is to lead to desiccation is to lead to the drying up of life it's to lead it leads to a death and therefore tradition can be seen as a life-giving good thing uh, and that means Catholicism, for example, or um, some, of, some of our political values, which have come from uh, the other Latin traditions, uh, should be kept flowing through our lives and, and, and forward-looking, progressing to the future. Um, does that make you a reactionary? Well, it's a very strange analogy uh, to, uh, to uh, to make us reactionaries. I, I think, once again, uh, Catholics uh, and those who are maligned as being reactionaries are, are actually the, uh, the, the world's progressives and radicals at this moment. Talking of which, uh, where do you stand on, on your fellow Catholic, Jacob Rees-Mogg? I, I, I think he's great. Uh, I, I knew him. Bef I, I knew of him before he uh, ascended to this very public uh, uh, position he has now. And um, I've known him through, known about him through Catholic uh, subcultures in, in Britain, and we've always had a great. Uh, what hiding behind the the woodwork when the um when the Protestants come to uh, arrest you? <laughs> that kind of thing in the priest hole. Uh, that that kind of thing. Uh, I've known people who know him uh, as well, and they have always spoke very highly of him. He's a, a, he has a brilliant intellectual. Uh, f uh, uh, force in, in, in politics and I think the the honesty uh, and integrity of his uh, arguments and, and his very respectful way of dealing with with uh, opponents win, wins him a lot of friends uh, across the political divide uh, I don't think he'll ever be prime minister I don't think he wants to be prime minister uh, but I have a lot of admiration for him List, listening to you speak I mean I've, I've, I've never met you before but 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 actually there's a sort of absolute seriousness in what you believe and and your faith, which comes across in your your music. I mean, I I'm, I'm listening to you. I'm almost as transported as I am listening to your work. Where you talked about the numinous, it, it is very very special that you that you can do that. I was wondering how how do you get on with your fellow composers? I, is is classical music composition and classical music generally? like the other arts where it's full of lovers basically left lefty lovers uh well on a, a number of uh levels i got on very well with my fellow composers I, I i enjoy their company i i serve them as as an interpreter i conduct my fellow composers music all over the world living and dead and therefore i, I feel a kind of solidarity with them we're on the same side but I'm also aware that, especially perhaps uh, nowadays, that perhaps the, uh, that many of them would not consider uh, the seriousness of the claims I make for the numinous in the same way. Nevertheless, as, as I pointed out earlier, there is this umbilical link between music and the sacred, regardless. And, 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 you know, those of us who love classical music, people who love classical music, whether they're religious or not in a conventional sense, talk about music as being the most spiritual of the arts. And they mean a lot of different things for that, by that, perhaps. But, you know, the people who love going to hear the back passions at Easter time. They may be atheist, they may be agnostic, but they're, they're, they're cognizant of the deep heritage that this music gives to uh, the present world, and they're respectful of it, and they're thankful for it. And that means that there's a respect amongst the, the mus musical community, including uh, composers, for what has given us the culture we have, and that deep Judeo-Christian heritage that I was talking about earlier. What about the um, the critics, the, the the ones who badgered you at that? At the, was it Oregon 
mu- music festival who were asking you about Brexit. Were they all kind of American liberals? Or? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I, I don't. I have a reasonable relationship with critics. Uh, I, I don't know many of them, uh, but uh, I'm at that stage in my life where I, I honestly don't read reviews anymore. Uh, people, people don't believe you when they say that. But but you know, it doesn't really matter anymore what the critics say. But you know, it's it's curious what they do say, and when it's brought to your attention, there was one critic here. Uh, I'll always remember this, and it kind of points to who they are. Uh, and what the, how they think, the group think at work. Uh, I was giving a pre-concert talk, uh, live on the stage actually, so the full audience was there, and I quoted from Roger Scruton, uh, from uh, Death, Devoted Heart, which is book on Wagner, and this critic, uh, I think it was The Guardian, uh, said that um, the quoting of the Scruton was perilous. Now what did he mean by that? Was, did, was it perilous for me? Uh, was it perilous for those hearing that uh, Scruton quoted? Was it a threat uh, that this was beyond the pale? It's one of those left-wing words like problematic. Problematic is is, is it inappropriate? Sort of, in, inappropriate, exactly. It, it it pretends that it makes no moral judgment. It pretends that it sort of comes from the ether that there is this some absolute standard. Uh, that everyone accepts, mm-hmm. and that this standard is it, that it's failed to meet this standard. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, I mean, the having said that, though, and it does, it, it did annoy me. It made me very angry at the time. Nevertheless, as I said, the, the world of music is is a friendly world for me. It's the other arts where we can sometimes have difficulty. Writers, uh, uh, especially, I sometimes have a bit of a uh, to do with. Uh, s- s- People involved in the Scottish art scene, especially writers who all uh, who were all kind of seduced by the nationalists a few years ago when the referendum was yeah. on. So I see that they can be easily led and they fall in, in step very easily with the, with the new kind of populist uh, creed, the new populist religion, and nationalism became a kind a kind of a pseudo replacement religion in Scotland during that. T- Time. I want to find out more about what's happening in Scotland because I haven't been there for a while and you can you can tell me. Um, you're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special guest, Sir James McMillan, one of our greatest composers. More in a moment. Sonny Johnson brings her cutting-edge conservative commentary to Sirius XM Patriot every week on Sonny's Corner. So there's one simple rule that I follow. You should always protect and defend ideas and principles, not people. People will let you down. Your ideas and your principles will keep you steady through any storms. Sunny's Corner, every Saturday at noon east on Breitbart News Saturday. Sirius XM Patriot 125. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and my very special guest, Sir James McMillan. Um, you live in Scotland, I, I presume. Yes, that's right. Um, I hear rumours that come south of the wall that terrible things are going on uh, among, the, among the wildlings. I don't know if you watch Game of Thrones. <laughs> but but I, I mean, some of the things that, that the SNP seem to be doing seem to be a kind of form of soft fascism. Yes, it's become quite an unpleasant environment to talk about these things uh, up north. Uh, the um, independence devo- debate damaged our society. It ended friendships. In the, in the way that Brexit did, did south of the border, I think actually. so. E- even worse, I think. It, uh, um, it lingers on. Uh, it splits families. Um, um, not so much my immediate family, but I know that my wife's uh, immediate family were of the other persuasion, and I tried to keep out of out of it all for a while. But eventually, I had to declare for various reasons that you know uh, I wanted to be, support the no side, and mainly because there was a concerted effort by the nationalists to get the arts community, the creative community, on board um, 
uh, as tub thumpers for their cause, and a lot of them stepped up and uh, and and were used as uh, political poodles and still are. And uh, uh, that annoyed me. Uh, there were people saying that the full creative community in Scotland were behind the separatists, and it's clearly not the case. It's certainly not the case in the classical music world, and it's it's less the case in the visual arts. But it seems to have a a, a, a stronghold in sometimes literature. Um, but you know, uh, it's being lit Scottish literature is being adly, uh, adversely affected by this political development. Um, if the, if you end up writing for a cause, uh, become a propagandist for a, a, a political viewpoint, you um, demean yourself as an artist and demean your art. And there's clear evidence that that is having a detrimental impact on Scottish letters. You, uh, you can't name names, I suppose, it'll get you into trouble. Yeah. D d did you um, did you come under sort of unpleasant pressure from the from the the Nats to to endorse their cause? Um, the uh, the unpleasantness came when they realised I wasn't going to. Uh, there was a little moment at the beginning when there were approaches made by both sides, uh, and they they sh they assumed that. Uh, uh, I would get on board because that's what all the rest of them were doing, and I held back. But when it became clear that uh, I, I was quite uh, seriously resisting the drift to nationalism, and as you say, a kind of soft fascism, there were, there were, there were fascists involved in the the beginnings of the Nationalist Party, um, which they tried to soft pedal and downplay. But you know, it's something I would never want to be involved in, and that's when that's when the unpleasantness started. When you start reminding them, for example, that Hugh McDermott, who's their great kind of poetic uh, secular saint um, uh, was a supporter of Mussolini um, uh, uh, celebrated the bombing of London in 1941 uh, they don't like being reminded of that but there's that element you know the, the Ireland has it as well where uh, Irish nationalists were uh, quite clearly collaborating with Hitler and the, the ambassador from Germany and we had the same people up in types of people up in Scotland and they were the founders of the SNP who were the other? Who were the other people who sort of did the brave thing and 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 joined you in in sort of saying no, I'm not going to go with this. It's tricky actually because not many of them came out of the woodwork because it, be it became so fearful. There's a, a marvelous singer, and I won't say her name actually because she took such a a hammering from them that she eventually pulled back and she worried about her career but a major um, performing artist uh, was quite quite clearly of, of my persuasion on the matter and uh, was tweeting and so on and writing about it but took such a backlash that she stepped back and I, I, for, for, for reasons that uh, I think uh, might be clear. I hesitate to say her name. People can find could easily find mm -hmm. out who that is. But uh, there are lots of people like that. People who will say things in private, even writers, uh, um, but will be terrified of saying it uh, publicly. That's what we've come to in Scotland. Yeah, it's a shame, isn't it? That <sighs> you mentioned Ireland, and I, 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 I think we, we English, we. Sassanax, as I, as I believe you call us, <laughs> we we um we have a sort of the, this this fraught relationship where where we've 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 achieved so much together. I mean, you think of the sort of uh, Anglo-Irish literature, mm -hmm. and 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 you think of what you Scots gave us in the Enlightenment. I mean, I I, I studied English literature, and I read Henryson. Uh, his testament of crusade which was is is up there with chaucer it's just a le later version o of it um and all the sort of intellectual developments that happened thereafter and all the sort of inventors that 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 you gave us yeah. and i look uh, and of course um boswell yeah. james boswell is one of my heroes mm -hmm. you read boswell and you think he is a man as i am and yet he was writing how many hundred years 300 years ago yeah. um but i look at scotland now uh, and it it seems to be largely a sort of welfare dependency with a f with a few spots of talent. Is is that is that fair? Uh, couldn't possibly comment. But uh, you, the the names that you mention 
are the very ones that are not celebrated by Nationalist Scotland. Henderson, Boswell, uh, they, they are only celebrated for their use for the cause, uh, I, either from the past but certainly from the present. Uh, so if they step up and declare themselves as supporters of the, uh, the, the big project, they will be celebrated. So Henderson's forgotten about, he's never talked about, uh, it's pre-Reformation anyway, so that's another thing. Uh, Boswell, ignored. Um, and, you know, I, I love Boswell. I, I'm from the same part of the, the world as Boswell. But there's a wonderful Boswell book festival in Auchinleck, uh, which is where, where Boswell had his house. And, um, and and it's one of the one of the beautiful little gems uh, of Scotland. I want to go there. No, Please come. Yes, the, you would go down very well. And uh, uh, and there's uh, we, we have lots of heretics uh, in in that uh, in that festival, and people can speak their mind, which is not the case in other parts of the, some of the, the the literary and arts world in Scotland these days. Oh, so you, are you involved with that festival? Yes, I am actually, and uh, I have my own little festival now, which is a, a kind of a sister festival to the Boswell book festival my festival's called the Cumnock Trist uh, which is the the town where I grew up um, so I think I'm very proud of it it's become a, a new baby for me we've had the likes of Nicola Benedetti playing she's she's our patron the 16 have been the king singers um, we, uh, no, the wor- some of the world's greatest musicians are coming to Cumnock and uh, it's a music festival so you could say it's less political but we have a very close symbiotic relationship with the Boswell Book Festival there in the next village as it were and we perform, we, we have them doing literary things for us and we do musical things for them so uh, if you're vi- visit your listeners keep us in mind East Ayrshire is a, a marvellous part of Scotland it's a ver- so forgotten what, little corner What time of year, of year is it? Uh, the Cumnock Trist is early October uh, so it's an autumn festival, but we're expanding, and the Boswell Book Festival is May. And and are there any midges? Uh, I'm afraid so. Although by by October time, you should be safe. Do you know that something like fifty percent of of tourists visiting Scotland say they will not come back because of the of the midges? Well, that's something we can we can't do anything about. We might be able to vote the government no, you out, have, but you have machines. Apparently, there are these new machines that suck them up. And I, I've been hearing about this. Yeah, I, I'll see it when I believe it when believe I see it. it. Believe it when you when you see it. Um, <laughs> you said that um you don't um you write uh, sacred music, but d- doesn't some of your music get accidentally used in films and stuff? Is it? Uh, I mean, I mean, like I I don't, I don't know whether you your music appeared in. La Grande Bellezza, but lots of lots of lots of interesting modern classical music did. Do, do you ever ever find yourself being sucked into films and things? Um, I've heard and been, been aware of my music appearing for uh, in television programmes, yeah. uh, not not film as such. Although people sniff around from time to time, and uh, it's a different world for me. I've had the odd conversation with. Uh, film directors but I just couldn't do it I've got to play a music a composer has to play second fiddle to the director and I, I'm not being arrogant saying I couldn't do that it's just a completely different mindset a different way of working so you mean when you're composing for film do you have to look at the rushes and then write to the rushes yeah and the director would be over your shoulder all the time and getting you to cut things and uh, I admire those who do it. I've got great friends who do it, but I right. just couldn't do it. But I'm not. I'm not going to ask you to be arrogant here. But is there a kind of a hierarchy? I mean, is 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 there? A <laughs> if you write for film, are you slightly there down the? I I wouldn't say that, but I know that um, in the classical world, people use the term "it's only film music" or right. "it reminds me of film music," and it's a, it's a kind of detrimental thing to say. I wouldn't say that, uh, but but I've noticed that uh, when you know when critics are being sniffy about my music, they they use terms like Hollywood and uh, filmic as, as a they? term of criticism. Well, because because you're you're I mean you are definitely accessible. You write. I, I mean, I, I isn't isn't one of the problems with with some modern classical music that uh, it sort of follows the sort of Schoenbergy path, and it's it's self consciously difficult, and you're not. Well, this is a big a big issue. The the twentieth century uh, involved a separation of the ways between the bigger audience and the composing community. There's lots of different reasons for why for, for, for why that was the case, and uh, it does mean that a lot of people regard modern classical music, modern art music, as esoteric and difficult. And um, there's 
various levels you can come into that uh, and contradict it. There's lots of living composers who are, who are not difficult and who, who speak uh, genuinely, uh, but are no less serious than the likes of Schoenberg or, or Stockhausen or Boulez. Arvo Pert for ex- is an example of someone who has a mass appeal uh, but takes his work very, very seriously. Um, the biggest criticism that the avant-garde critics can say of people like myself is that we're, we're not serious composers, uh, which is a, a you know, it's a, it's a, it's meant to be an insult. It's a calumny. It's a, uh, it's, it's it's not true. Um, we take our our music as serious as as anyone else, uh, and we don't dumb down. Uh, I certainly don't write down or pay, play to a gallery. But the idea of communication from one mind to another is is a big consideration for me. My ideal listener. I do have such a thing as an ideal listener, uh, and, and again, I don't want to be arrogant when I say my ideal listener is someone a bit like me. And what I mean by that is someone who is as thirsty and hungry for encountering music that I've not yet encountered uh, before. So you were saying about um, your ideal listener is... Yes, my ideal listener is a bit like me, meaning uh, someone who is as curious and as hungry and thirsty for hearing music they don't know yet. Um, and not every classical music listener is like that. And there's a, there is a, a degree of reserve and conservatism of, of the negative sort in the classical music world in that they know what they like and they like what they know. Now, my love of classical music has taken me always to places uh, uh, and music I didn't know. I didn't know Wagner when I was 12, so I made it, my, made it the point of finding out all his music. I didn't know music from the Far East and other cultures. I've made it my point to find out about that. Um, so I've, I have a curiosity about uh, unknown music, which uh, I think is the is the way in for many. And um, if people have that curiosity for making new encounters, uh, then I'll be able to speak to them. Can you listen to pop music? Uh, I do off and on. Uh, I was um, I mean, I used to play in a, a little band when I, in my teenagers. Now this was the early seventies, yeah. so it was before punk even. And it's uh, we used to do a lot of co- covers of uh, Cream and the Rolling Stones and so on. So ever since then, I, I've lost touch. My kids listen to things that I, I just don't get. But I did uh, Desert Island Discs recently, and it, oh, yeah. it's a way of telling a life story. And I had to deal with my teenage years, so I, um, uh, I chose Silver Machine by Hawkwind. Oh, uh, right. You're is, that period. So, yeah, yeah, that is very much pre-punk, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was. Which is a, a load of bullshit, to be yeah. honest. But um, It's it, almost it, prog, it isn't it? I mean, yeah. getting on there. Yeah, yeah. But there was a connection between classical and and, and prog. Well, you think a, about a lot Rick- of people, Rick Wakeman, Keith Emerson, um, uh, were fascinated by it. And uh, it's I suppose it's a guilty pleasure a pleasure of mine. Sometimes I go on YouTube and find uh, uh, old things by Gentle Giant and King Crimson. And right, <laughs> I don't tell anybody about it, although I now have. So that's my credibility. Was that window. your was that your right age group, or, or was it because you were living in Scotland and you were slightly behind the times? <laughs> Uh, you're so diplomatic. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, Tales of Topographic Oceans uh, came out in that, 1973. Right. I was 14, so it was just okay. Just so right you know, so no, that's yeah. fair enough. I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm being. Yeah, yeah. But you did, you did choose a particularly sort of chin-stroking <laughs> era. Yeah. Should we say l- yeah. a less than credible? Completely era, un- incredible. Have you met? Have you met any of them? Have you met Rick? Well, I want to meet. No, Rick, I'd love Rick, to. Rick, I like what I see of them and hear them. Yeah. got a great sense of humour. Takes oh, himself. Oh, what about the new lot? I'm a massive fan of Mogwai. Uh huh. Um, but th- who are very much Scott Nats, I think. But, yeah, but yeah. I, I like the music. Yes, I, I I don't know enough about it, but uh, uh, um, I'll, I'll explore it. It could it could influence your your next thing. Do, do you think that you could have got as far as you have had you you made your politics so overt earlier on? Would it have been a hindrance? Uh, well, that's a that's an, an interesting question. Uh, I try very hard to. Um, to be circumspect about politics, some might say you, I'm not you, doing very well. This is the podcast that <laughs> yes, killed your career. Well, exactly. Uh, I regard myself as a moderate because yeah. I used to be on the left. So my journey in the last, well, all through my life has been from uh, extremism uh, 
uh, to moderation. How so, left were you? Well, I was a, a member of the Young Communist League. Uh, in the early in the mid seventies, when I was listening to uh, prog rock. So, what, uh, so what did you believe then? Uh, I believed in the Soviet Union. Uh, all the all my mentors, the, the older people in the party, were Stalinists, and um, uh, I feel very guilty about that. I mean, I don't make light of it. I, I I don't like telling people that I was. Some people boast about, oh, I used to be a communist, and they and they get credit for it. Of course, if you say you used to be a Nazi, of course uh, you'd still go to jail. <laughs> but if, if you can get away with it, in fact, you're kind of lauded for being a, a, being uh, having fallen for the communist creed. Uh, why I don't know because it's just as hateful and as murderous as Nazism, so I I feel very guilty about it uh, as a Catholic, um, and I, I fought against my relatives. Um, my grandfather especially was very hurt by it because he used to fight against the communists and the National Union of Mine Workers in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So he couldn't understand why I threw him a lot in with them for a little while. So I feel very guilty about it. My grandfather was right about that. Uh, if there's such a place as purgatory, I will go there uh, for what what I did for giving succour to some of the, the most seriously evil people in the world. What was the, the thing that got you out of it? I think it was a gradual thing. Uh, I quoted from uh, my article in Fatherhood at the beginning of this podcast, and uh, uh, people think that uh, having children makes you more moderate in some ways, and uh, some people say more right-wing. I still don't regard myself as a right-winger. Lots of people do. But I was always accused of being a right-winger, even when I was in the Communist Party, even when I was in the Labour Party. But the, the, there's so much internecine strife in the left, as you know, that they're always um, calling people traitors, even today. Um, you can see that, uh, so I, that that doesn't bother me. But I, I think I think what struck me where the first time it struck me that I was diverging from the comrades was uh, was the um, uh, the Falklands War. Um, I just couldn't understand why the likes of Tony Benn and left wingers were giving succour to fascists, uh, um, that like the the fascist junta of Argentina. I just could not get that at all, and um, I think Britain was right to take, take the, the, the retake the fault, Falklands, and um, uh, they stood up for democracy and freedom against militarism and uh, and all that the left fought against in the Second World War, and that's when I realised that the left probably had changed. But although some people say now that the left was never uh, uh, was always. Uh, uh, in that sense, you know, making deals where it suited them, such as the the Nazi um, Soviet pact. I think you've chosen the hard path. Mm. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I st I still still get in incredulity from people who should know better. Uh, I'm not making a, a, a radical right wing case about anything. Uh, I, I'm a moderate. Uh, yeah, but I in Scotland, a moderate is 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 a virtually a, a fascist in their eyes. Well, they they throw that word around. People who don't know uh, what fascism means uses that use that word a lot. Well, um, thank you, James, Sir James, for being brave and for fighting to defend Western civilization, which I think you are. I I, I really do. Well, it's very kind of you. You're very welcome and. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, uh, being interested in what I'm doing. No. Um, well, I, I hope that lots of people will, 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 will come to your festival and, and check out your music. Um, you're listening to the Darling Pod podcast with me, James Dunkong, and my very special, wonderful guest, Sir James McMillan. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.